Hello, everyone. I'm Kamran. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we will be discussing Book 4, Chapter 19 of Dead House Gates, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 3 of our coverage of this chapter. Is this Part 3 or Part 4? Billy, I don't know that we've ever gotten to a four-parter for a chapter, <laughs> but that may be possible in the future. I'm afraid it could be more possible. Than, and we may cross into something more than four. I'm a scared. I'm a scared. <laughs> that would be a long chapter. Five hours worth of material about one chapter. I hope that's not the case. I don't think that's the case, is it? <laughs> I, I look at the size of those things on my shelf, and I'm like, hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not intimidated. I'm, I'm excited by this. Don't get me wrong. I shall progress then, shall I? <laughs> this is one foot in front of the other. We'll get there eventually. Yes, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, this podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the book set in the Malaysian universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Just know that Common and I know that this series is the best fantasy story ever written, and we're approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view. There will be no literary critique. This we're going to sit here and marvel at Mr. Erickson's light endeavorous series of books. And mm. this is the most light endeavorousness I have ever seen in this chapter. Yeah, this is some good stuff. Yes, it is. We'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. A quick warning. Today's episode contains descriptions of extreme violence, and it's not recommended for children. Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we really like to hear from you, and we do really mean that. Not like every other podcast that says, hey, we'd like to hear from you. We are extremely sincere when we say we want to hear from you. So send any feedback or comments that you have to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. And keep it nice, please. <laughs> There's this one guy I've been listening to. And he says, keep it loose, keep it light. When he asks for comments on YouTube, it's kind of funny. Oh, there we go. All right. Chapter 19, part three. We pick up the chapter with Duiker and the Chain of Dogs. They were at Vathar's edge where the basolith of bedrock sank beneath its skin of limestone. And the land that stretched southward below their vantage point was nothing but studded stones in windswept parched clay. They came upon the first of the Jagut tombs. Few among the outriders and the column's head paid it much attention. It looked like nothing more than a cairn marker, a huge elongated slab of stone tilted upward at the southernmost end. Corporal List had led Duiker to it in silence while the others prepared rigging to assist in the task of guiding the wagons down the steep, winding descent to the plain's barren floor. That sounds like a lot of fun. Trying to roll those wagons down the hill with the technology available would be a challenge. Oh, yes. <laughs> I like that you use the term, the technology available. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very kind way of putting it. Block and tackle is basically yeah. all you have, right? Yeah. They can't really use any majory or magics here. Yes. <laughs> because they don't have the mages necessary to do it. And these wagons are filled with bodies of wounded yeah. soldiers. Mm. And if the mages have anything in them, they're saving them for reserve, you know. Exactly. You know. They can't be used for this. <laughs> Liss said, the youngest son, as he stared down at the tomb. Liss's face wore a father's grief, as raw as if the child's death was but yesterday. A grief that had, if anything, grown with the tortured, unfathomable passage of 200,000 years. Duerker thought, he stands guard still, that Jagut ghost. How to comprehend this? Duerker's voice was dry when he asked, how old? List said, five. The Talani mass chose this place for him. The effort of killing him would have proved too costly, given that the rest of the family still awaited them. So they dragged the child here, shattered his bones, every one, as many times as they could on so small a frame, then pinned him beneath this rock. And that makes me cringe to read. It's absolutely brutal. Yeah. It's pretty abhorrent behavior from the Talani mass. And this goes back to that earlier note that I had about them looking like the bad guys in their pursuit of eradicating the Jagut. Yeah, to say that they fellows are a little enthusiastic in their thoroughness and this cleansing. But I, I, I'll make a statement later on, but I'm going to go ahead and mention some of it now. We know the Jagut to be extremely powerful, and I think we're kind of overlooking at this point. Part of the, I think it's mentioned in gardens about the fact that when they would jump up those glaciers to block people from sin, they were so wanting to be alone 
how many millions did they kill doing that? You know, just one solitary one does that. You know, that's just one does that. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. It's like, why did they do this to this child? Is it because can they live past death? Are they gonna are they gonna regenerate? I mean, what what are these things? What are the Jakku capable of? We don't really even know. We don't even know what the Talanomans are capable of. <laughs> the kids were just watching Ender's Game. Okay. The book's been out a long time, so spoiler yeah. for those of you yeah. that <laughs> don't know the story of Ender's Game. At the end of it, the military has these genius kids attacking this planet. They think it's a simulation, but it's actually they're doing the real thing. Mm -hmm. I guess to spare them the advance knowing that they're committing genocide. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the premise is that they're doing it to end all future wars. So the threat is so existential that they don't see another path out. They have to absolutely eradicate these insect alien things that attacked Earth a long time ago, yeah. though they hadn't been hostile recently. I think it's a similar concept here where the tyrants, they talk a little bit about Jagut tyrants later in the chapter, but race in Gardens of the Moon was one of those that was imprisoned. And if any of them are capable of becoming a tyrant like that, I think that's your first and foremost, the largest issue is they're, yeah. they're capable of enslaving the entire planet, basically, through yeah. mind control and all that kind of stuff. Then the individuals, like you said, defensively, they have the ability to freeze an entire continent, all the native life on it, starving people out, probably freezing a bunch of people in the process as well. Mm -hmm. Even if it is defensive, the amount of catastrophic life destruction, it's... Yeah. They incurred some wrath here. <laughs> the mm -hmm. Jagood are not blameless, let's just say, in this. But this this little five-year-old is blameless. I'll, I'll agree, but it's like, wow. But uh, I guess uh, we'll just say they're thorough. Mm -hmm. Thorough. <laughs> for, for lack of a better word. Very thorough. Very thorough. Very thorough, yeah. <laughs> very thorough Jeffrey. <laughs> He's a good doctor. <laughs> and thorough. <laughs> Duerker had thought himself beyond shock, beyond even despair, yet his throat closed up at Lis' toneless words. He forced himself to look away, watch the activities among the soldiers and Wiccans thirty paces distant. He realized that they worked mostly in silence, speaking only as their tasks required, and then in low, strangely subdued tones. Lis said, yes, the father's emotions are a pall unrelieved by time, so powerful, so rending, those emotions, that even the earth spirits had to flee. It was that or madness. Coltane should be informed. We must move quickly across this land. And that's a point about parents outliving their children. Yeah. Granted, the dad also got taken out here, I, I assume, as well, by the same Talani mass eventually. Mm. He's a ghost, right? right? But the concept of having to watch when your kids die is yeah. terrifying. That's a, bad, that's a bad thing, yeah. Duker asked, and ahead on the Nenoth plain? List said, it gets worse. It was not just the children that the Talan MS pinned, still breathing, still aware, beneath rocks. Wait, 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 wait. So the child, even after they've broken all the bones, is still aware under the rocks. And alive, yes. <laughs> and alive, okay. Yes. Okay. Until I wow. guess they starve to death? Is that the only way they can kill these things? I don't know. <laughs> well, we know of something, I know of something, of things pinned that don't quite go away. Duker asked, but why? Liz said, pogroms need no reason, sir. None that can weather challenge, in any case. Difference in kind is the first recognition, the only one needed, in fact. Land domination, preemptive attacks, all just excuses. Mundane justifications that do nothing but disguise the simple distinction. They are not us. We are not them. Duker asked, did the Jagut seek to reason with them, Corporal? List said, many times, among those not thoroughly corrupted by the power, the tyrants. But you see, there was always an arrogance in the Jagut, and it was a kind that could claw its way up your back when face to face. Each Jagut's interest was with him or herself, almost exclusively. They viewed the Talani mass no differently from the way they viewed ants underfoot, herds on the grasslands, or indeed the grass itself. Ubiquitous, a feature of the landscape. A powerful emergent people, such as the Talani mass were, could not be stung. Duerker asked, to the point of swearing a deathless vow? 
List said, I don't believe that at first the Talani mass realized how difficult the task of eradication would be. Jagut were very different in another way. They did not flaunt their power. And many of their efforts in self-defense were passive. Barriers of ice, glaciers. They swallowed the lands around them, even the seas, swallowed whole continents, making them impassable, unable to support the food the mortal Imas required. Duerker said, so they created a ritual that would make them immortal. Liss said, free to blow like dust, and in the age of ice, there was plenty of dust. Duerker's gaze caught Coltane standing near the edge of the trail. He asked List, how far until we leave this area of, of sorrow? Liss said, two leagues, no more than that. Beyond are Nanoth's true grasslands, hills, tribes, each one very protective of what little water they possess. Duerker said, I think I had better speak with Coltane. Liss said, aye, sir. I appreciate that information about the Jagut and Talan Imas relationship. The Jagut had an interesting nature to them, almost narcissistic. Would you agree with that? Yes, very narcissistic in the fact they were so self-absorbed. I, I've brought up many times that there's things that, about an old, an old fantasy writer. He's still alive, Michael Moorcock, who writes very pulpy stuff about the Eternal Champion. He's written several series about the Eternal Champion, but they've been about different people. And one of them in particular was the Vad Hog race, which is Coram. I've mentioned him before. But this race was very similar, that they were very isolationistic. They might gather as a family, possibly but usually just lived by themselves for millennia, just wanting to be left alone to create or do what they wanted to do and just kind of a yeah, very self-absorbed race. Hmm. Seems like it'd be kind of lonely. Well, I think the problem lie in the fact that these people are so long livid that once you've hung out with somebody, it's like, you know, for a couple thousand years, you know, it's like, <sighs> hmm. I'm going to go over here for a little bit. And just, I, I've, I just can't, if I see that guy again, I'm just going to, I'm just going to kill him. I'm just going to mm -hmm. kill him. I'm going to kill myself. If, if, they, if he tells me one more time, 10,000 years, he won't let it go. It's like, it's like come on. It's three, it's 300,000 for the IMS. They ain't let it go yet. Mm -hmm. That's a long time to hold a grudge. That's a grudge. <laughs> That's a grudge. Whew. Are we going to have to swear a deathless vow to finish these books? It might require <laughs> it, it might possibly require that. Maybe maybe not to make it through Ericsson's, but to get through all of Esselmont, yeah. Because <laughs> mm. he ain't stopping. Esselmont is not stopping. Apparently that guy's just cranking them out. Yeah. And then we wanted to get to Dune eventually and some other stuff. I mean, if, if we could do this full time, then we could right. do multiple episodes a week. That's right. And we would do multiple episodes a week. Mm -hmm. I would do at least four a week. Four a week, Billy. Okay, sorry. Two. two. So we'd have to have some additional editors. Well, yes, I'm counting for the big picture. <laughs> I'm looking. I, I'm, I'm of course looking for downtown the the horse fraud production downtown Kerrville, the small building. It's, mm. it's actually the office space above the downtown restaurant. It's a, it's just this lovely loft I've always wanted. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. The horse fraud production's headquarters. Yes. Yeah. Future headquarters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is this earmark? Make it so. <laughs> <laughs> so the Jagut, when they would freeze these continents, the food that they would eat, what, what do you think they sustain themselves with? Now, this is a question I have always had, and I've never talked about with you before. I don't believe about the essence of magic in certain universes. Can these fellas just, can they create things like X and Halo? And I mean, that's like, that's Latin for like out of nothing. I mean, like, could they create their own food out of nothing? I don't think we've seen any indication that magic users have that ability. Okay. The one thing that's so, which is so fantastic about Mr. Erickson, he's so vague about everything. It's like mm. he keeps, he covers his bases so well. <laughs> now, I understand that part of this, because I think we see this in this series quite a bit. And this is how I understand this to work from this is from the DC universe of comics, mind you, is that your sorcery slash magic usability could also sub as like stat enhancements. You can, you know, strength, speed, you know, thing. I think that we see that used in this series, some in, in, in cases. And I know we see it used defensively and offensively, but I wasn't sure. You know, like, how are they creating this ice? Are they are they using are they this are they creating it out of the like? Well, they're doing it magically, but is it coming from someplace 
Well, Amto's Falak is ice aspected. Sure. I think that when they summon the power of that realm, they create the ice. Okay. Just because I, I mean, I imagine Amto's Falak is just, you know, if I thought, but what's colder? Is dark colder than Amto's Falak? Is that a valid question? Because we know it's cold. When I think of darkness, I think of it as the void of space that sure. has nothing. And that's absolute zero, isn't it? That's what I thought, too. It can't be. I guess it's not absolute. I guess things can. I, I, I don't know if it's. I guess when not in contact with sun, I think if you're in the shade, it's probably absolute zero. Yeah. So Father Light wasn't in the picture. Yeah. So it might be absolute zero, except except it's not quite absolute because they can still move around. <laughs> they can move around. They had trees growing yeah. in Carcanus. So I don't know. I don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> fuzzy picture here and so and, and still i have no answers <laughs> i do wonder if some of these elder races are sustained without food in some way but if that was the case when they pin this kid under the rock how did he eventually die i don't know yeah just weakness i imagine starved to death that's what i'm thinking too yeah uh, but maybe by doing so they cut off their access to their warm maybe they can feed like i'm just I, it's, it's gonna sound stupid so do they break this poor child up so it's, it's in so much pain it can't access its warm therefore cutting starving itself maybe they can somehow feed via almost like photosynthetically <laughs> like through photo, photosynthesis almost mm. uh, from their warm maybe they could draw power from their warm to sustain them possibly yeah. I don't have a lot of clarity on what they need to sustain themselves. Yeah. And, I, and from what I future know, and none of this will ever be answered by, you know, it's, it's never answered by anyone. It's just kind of, magic is always this nice vague thing. If we can't answer it, we'll just make it magic, you know, and therefore it answers the question of why I take, why we're able to do it. You know, it's magic, man. <laughs> there's a future instance that Billy and I are thinking of where there's something similar where the thing didn't die. So we're a little confused here. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's vague enough to where it's not a spoiler. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's very nice. Very nice you said, sir. <laughs> That, that exceeds Mr. Erickson's vagary, sir. Kudos. <laughs> Kudos to you, sir. Okay, we'll move on. The passage became known as the Dry March. Three vast, powerful tribes awaited them. Two of them, the Tregan and the Billard, striking at the column like vipers. The Kundril, situated on the western edge of the plains, made no immediate contact, though it was felt that that would not last. The pathetic herd accompanying the chain of dogs died on that march, animals simply collapsing. Even as the Wiccan cattle dogs converged with fierce insistence that they rise, dead or no, and resume the journey. When butchered, these carcasses were little more than ropes of leathery flesh. And it's interesting to me that they are talking about this herd dying as it walks, because I was under the impression that the herd was going to be slaughtered at the River Vathar, since they wouldn't survive this segment of the journey. That was my impression too. Yeah, I think they mentioned earlier in the book they were planning on killing them all, right? Yeah, that was a chapter or so back because it's not that far back, you know, that once we cross there, we're going to kill them all. So they won't be a drain on the resources and it's all, you know, it's, it's so we can stay alive for another few days at least or, you know, it seemed to be my impression I was getting from that note. Yeah, same for me. Did we catch him? Did we catch a mistake? It's possible. I don't know. Maybe they always plan to have a small amount of them with them, and that's what this is. Maybe the herd was much larger. Yeah. Okay. We'll go with that. <laughs> On a separate note, I've been researching ancient herding dog breeds. The Turkish Kangal seems to fit the picture I had of these dogs in my head the best. Have you heard of them before? I have not. Are they big fellas? Or are they kind of lower, sturdier, stout built? They can be. Okay. Are they built like, well, I see that you have a note on a Mastiff. Are they like Mastiffs? They're probably about that big. I've seen some pictures of these things with, they have to have chains around their necks because they're so beefy, standing up probably like four feet tall at the head, you know, without just when they're on their four legs, not on their hind legs. I think I've told it, I'll bring it up here now real quick, but my uncle had a Mastiff as a cattle dog and they're a real sweet nature dog. And, uh, but they're huge. And my father is six, seven. And there's a picture of this dog with his paws on my father's shoulder. And he's looking down into my father's face and he's that long and tall. That's a big boy. That's a big boy. And I mean, he's like a head definitely like, I mean, it's not just looking. It's like his head is over my father's kind of looking into it. Like he could just stick his head in his mouth almost like, wow, wow. 
they're magnificent dogs. <laughs> Just so you see how big these things can get, you're going to have to ignore the music here. Watch that short real quick. It's a puppy at first, then it shows the... Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Holy mackerel, that's a big boy. Yeah, they're pretty big. I'm just seeing this big fella in the yard, and he looks like he would eat a pit bull. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they're he, huge, it's man. like, oh, my word. I can see him. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Gee, Willikers. <laughs> Yeah, they're a couple thousand year old breed. Okay. Beautiful animal. My word, there he is next to that fella. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's about the size of that fella looking <laughs> down at my dad's face. Yeah. Yeah. About like that. Okay. That's a no. What the heck no? <laughs> now, <laughs> if, if I'm on his good side, yeah. But I don't want to have to feed that fella. Yeah. <laughs> or clean up after it. How much do your dogs eat? Do, you, do your dogs eat quite a bit? You got some big fellas, don't you? One of them would eat as much as she is fed. The other one right. doesn't like to eat that much. Oh, okay. And she's a little bit more lithe in her figure than the, you know, the first one. There, there, there's, the, there's the comment made in the other guys about his car having taken a dump, so to speak, and, and it was his little electric car or whatever. He was his Prius. You know, it's like. My, my mm -hmm. car my car craps these kind of it's like that's what the that mastiff looked like he just does that with pit bulls <laughs> <laughs> and huskies it's like those would be those would be like his size of his bowel movement you're like dad gum <laughs> i wouldn't want to have to clean up after big dogs mine are bad enough no starvation joined the terrible ravaging thirst for the wiccans refused to slaughter their horses and attended them with eloquent fanaticism that no one dared challenge the warriors sacrificed of themselves to keep their mounts alive. One petition from Nethpara's council offering to purchase a hundred horses was returned to the noble born leader smeared in human excrement. <laughs> Who do you think had the honor of preparing that document for them? I have no idea. I don't want to know. I just had to go run it through the trenches all you had to do. Man. Just using his toilet paper. It's like, hey, some toilet paper. They just probably were giving us a nice toilet paper. Thank you. Do you think elites are always this out of touch in every civilization? I believe so. What kind of response do you think these nobles expected? It's ridiculous. I, I believe yes. It's a perennial <laughs> thing in society, it would seem. It never goes away. It's a thing. <laughs> the two clans struck the column again and again, contesting every league. The attacks increasing in ferocity and frequency until it was clear that a major clash approached, only days away. In the column's wake followed Corbolo Dom's army, which had grown with the addition of forces from Tarxian and other coastal settlements, and was now at least five times the size of Coltane's seventh and his Wiccan clans. Corbolo's measured pursuit, leaving engagement to the Wild Plains tribes, was ominous in itself. He would be there for the imminent battle, without doubt, and was content to wait until then. The chain of dogs, its numbers swollen by new refugees fleeing by land, crawled on, coming within sight of what the maps indicated was the Nanoth Odon's end, where hills rose in a wall across the southern horizon. The trader track ran for seven leagues, opening out on a plain that faced the ancient tell of Sanimon, then wrapped around it to encompass the Sanith Odon, and beyond that, the Galene Plain, the Dojal Odon, and the city of Aaron itself. No relief army emerged from Sanamon Valley. A profound sense of isolation descended on the train, even as the valley's flanking hills began to reveal, in the day's dying light, twin encampments, both vast, of tribesmen, the main forces of the Tregan and the Billard. Here then, at the mouth of the ancient valley, here it would be. On the way to the briefing, Lull walked up beside Duiker and muttered, We're dying, and I don't mean just figuratively, old man. I lost 11 soldiers today, throats swollen so bad with thirst they couldn't draw breath. Hood's breath, I'm swimming in this armor. By the time we're done, we'll all look like Talani Mass. Duker said, I can't say I appreciate the analogy, Captain. Lull said, I wasn't expecting you to. Duker said, horse piss. That's what the Wiccans are drinking these days. Lull said, aye, same for my crew. They're neighing in their sleep, and more than one's died mm -hmm. from it. The desperation must be intense to go to this level. Yeah. Where's Bear Grylls when you need him? I'm sorry. I cannot stop thinking of urine drinking without <laughs> thinking about Bear Grylls drinking urine in some show or in some desert somewhere. 
doesn't surprise me <laughs> with him. Well, what's bad? There's an old Black Adder episode where the captains, it's like they get to this stage in this journey. It's like where they're, you know, we've got to this far. We're out of fresh water. It's like, well, we it's finally to this stage. We're finally drinking the urine. He goes, "Where's the captain?" It's like, then he gonna pony up? He says, "No, he's been drinking his for weeks now." He says he likes it. <laughs> 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 man I, I don't know if anybody could ever get to the point where they like it it's a necessity yeah. <laughs> in these scenarios you know it's hilarious three dogs loped past them the huge one named bent a female and the hengi's lap dog scrambling in their wake lull grumbled they'll outlive us all those damned beasts the sky deepened overhead the first stars appeared lull said gods i'm tired Duerker nodded. He thought, oh, indeed, we've traveled far, friend, and now stand face to face with Hood. He takes the weary as readily as the defiant, offers the same welcoming grin. Lull said, something in the air tonight, historian. Can you feel it? Duerker said, yes. Lull said, maybe Hood's warren has drawn closer. Duerker said, it has that feel, doesn't it? They arrived at the Fist's command tent and entered. The usual faces were arrayed before them. Nil and Nether, the last remaining warlocks, Solmar and Chenid, Bolt and Coltane himself, each had become a desiccated mockery of their former selves. Lull found his usual chair and asked, where's Bungle? Bolt said, listening to her sergeant, I'd guess, and gave Lull a ghost of a grin. Coltane had no time for idle talk. He said, something approaches this night. The warlocks have sensed it, though that is all they can say. We are faced with preparing for it. Dorker looked to Nether and asked, what kind of sense? She shrugged, then sighed. Vague, troubled, even outrage. I don't know. I don't know, historian. Dorker asked, sense anything like it before, even remotely? Nether said, no. Dorker thought, outrage. Coltane addressed the captains. Draw the refugees close. Double the pickets. Solmar said, fist. We face a battle tomorrow. Coltane said, aye, and rest is needed. I know. He began pacing, but it was a slower pace than usual. It had lost its smoothness as well, its ease and elegance. He went on, and more, we are greatly weakened. The water casks are bone dry. Duerker winced. He thought, battle? No, tomorrow we'll see a slaughter. Soldiers unable to fight, unable to defend themselves. Duerker cleared his throat, made to speak, then stopped. He thought, one word, yet even to voice it would be to offer the cruelest delusion. One word. Coltane was staring at him. He softly said, we cannot. Durker thought, I know. For the rebellion's warriors as much as for us, the end to this must be with blood. Lull said, the soldiers are beyond digging trenches. Coltane said, holes then. Lull said, aye, sir. Durker thought, holes. To break mounted charges, snap legs, send screaming beasts into the dust. The briefing ended then, abruptly, as the air was suddenly charged, and whatever threatened to arrive now announced itself with a brittle crackle, a mist of something oily, like sweat clogging the air. Coltane led the group outside to find the bristling atmosphere manifested tenfold beneath the night's sparkling canopy. Horses bucked, cattle dogs howled. Soldiers were rising like specters, weapons rustled. In the open space just beyond the foremost pickets, the air split asunder with a savage, ripping sound. Three pale horses thundered from that rent, followed by three more, then another three, all harnessed, all screaming with terror. Behind them came a massive carriage, a fire-scorched, gaudily painted leviathan riding atop six spoked wheels that were taller than a man. Smoke trailed the thick strands of raw wool from the carriage, from the horses themselves, and from the three figures visible behind the last three chargers. The white screaming train was at full gallop, as if in headlong flight from whatever warren it had come from, and the carriage pitched wildly, alarmingly, as the beasts plunged straight for the pickets. Wiccan scattered to either side. Staring with disbelief, Duerker saw all three figures sawing at the reins, bellowing, flinging themselves against the backrests of their tottering perch. <laughs> it takes three individuals to <laughs> handle these horses <laughs> with the reins. Well imagine they they had they were at full speed and they break out in the middle of an encampment and have to go from you know full speed to to a stop that's got to be hard to do especially because you don't know what you're going to be opening out into get a nice drift going when you yeah. land wherever. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you flip one of those things <laughs> <You're> right <laughs> are we doing malazan drift here <laughs> sorry
Have you seen that meme where they took the Polar Express when they're drifting on the ice and then they put the Tokyo Drift music to it? It's hilarious. No. Yeah, it's really no, funny. I'll check it out. The horses drove hooves into the earth, biting down on their momentum, the towering carriage slewing behind them, raising a cloud of smoke, dust, and an emanation that Duerker recognized with a jolt of alarm as outrage. The outrage, he now understood, of a warren and its god. Behind the lead carriage came another, then another, each pitching to one side or the other to avoid collision as they skidded to a halt. As soon as the lead carriage ceased its headlong plunge, figures poured from it, armored men and women, shouting, roaring commands that no one seemed to pay any attention to, and waving blackened, smeared, and dripping weapons. A moment later, even as the other two carriages stopped, a loud bell clanged. The frenzied, seemingly aimless activities of the figures promptly ceased. Weapons were lowered, and sudden silence filled the air behind the fading echo of the bell. Snorting and stamping, the lathered horses tossed their heads, ears twitching, nostrils wide. And what an entrance mm. that was. Yeah. I was curious what Warren they came from, but I think they answer it later down the road here. I think they do. I think because we'll come up, I think we'll come up on that. But I believe this to be one of the best entrances in the whole series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. those horses they leave quite the impression and i would <laughs> guess that they probably have ptsd i love that there is so many horses in this book in particular that are just so stamped on our memory but yeah the ptsd horses are what stick with me too and i think the better question of of this whole group that just came out of here is who doesn't have ptsd <laughs> this group <laughs> oh yeah that's a good point in the scene who among the members of this scene yeah it has not <laughs> it doesn't happen at this point yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the only thing point. That everyone knows this it's the only way we know we're alive anymore i think is the ptsd lets us know we're alive <laughs> pretty much everybody that's alive in these books at this point has ptsd <laughs> now that i'm thinking about it yeah yeah this yeah this whole book is like this is a mental health care <laughs> book if there ever was one yeah everyone in this world probably suffers from some form of ptsd hey if, yeah. if you live in a place where ascendants can just kind of drop hunks a rock from the sky on you or do or turn into dragons suck you down their mall you know it's like I, i'm assuming it's kind of you know it's a pretty dangerous place to live <laughs> yeah until you can ascend to be one of those things that when something tries to eat you yes. you just bolt right in and tear its guts up like yeah. those hounds. <laughs> 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 yeah yes, sir. yeah i want to be that kind of ascendant <laughs> right yes absolutely the lead carriage was no more than 15 paces from where Duerker and the others stood. Duerker saw a severed hand clinging to an ornate <laughs> projection on one side of the carriage. After a moment, it fell to the ground. A tiny barred door opened and a man emerged, with difficulty, as he squeezed his considerable bulk through the aperture. He was dressed in silks that were drenched in sweat. His round, glistening face revealed the passing echoes of some immense, all-consuming effort. In one hand, he carried a stoppered bottle. Stepping clear, he faced Coltane and raised the bottle. In strangely accented malazan, he said, You, sir, have much to answer for. Then he grinned, displaying a row of gold-capped, diamond-studded teeth. He went on, Your exploits tremble the warrens. Your journey is wildfire in every street in Daruzhistan, no doubt in every city, no matter how distant. Have you no notion how many beseech their gods on your behalf? Coffers overflow. Grandiose plans of salvation abound. Vast organizations have formed, their leaders coming to us, to the Trigal Trade Guild, to pay for our fraught passage, though, he added in a lower tone, all the guild's passages are fraught, which is what makes us so expensive. He unstoppered the bottle and continued, The great city of Daruzhistan and its remarkable citizens, dismissing in an instant your empire's voracious desires on it and on themselves, bring you this gift, by way of the shareholders. He paused and waved back at the various men and women behind him, now gathering into a group, then went on. Of Trigal, the foulest, tempered, greediest creatures imaginable. But that is neither here nor there, for here we are, are we not? Let it not be said of the citizens of Daruzhistan that they are insensitive to the wondrous, and, dear sir, you are truly wondrous. The preposterous man stepped forward, suddenly solemn. He spoke softly. Alchemists, mages, sorcerers have all contributed, offering vessels with capacities belying their modest containers. Coltane of Crow Clan, Chain of Dogs, I bring you food, I bring you water. 
That is a stand up and cheer moment if I've ever oh, seen one. Absolutely. I, my fist was, I had my fist in the air for a good two or three minutes. Just like, yes. Yes. <laughs> just like, yes. It just kind of stayed there. Karpolan Demisand was one of the original founders of the Trigal Trade Guild, a citizen of the small fortress city of the same name, situated south of the Lamatath Plain on the continent of Genabacus. And that's interesting. The Lamatath Plain itself lies in the south of Genabacus already. The area south of it really isn't fleshed out in the main series. It's more on the Esselmont side of the house. Okay. Born of a dubious alliance between a handful of mages, Carpolan among them, and the city's benefactors, a motley collection of retired pirates and wreckers, the guild came to specialize in expeditions so risk-laden as to make the average merchant pale. Each caravan was protected by a heavily armed company of shareholders, guards who possessed a direct stake in the venture, ensuring the fullest exploitation of their abilities. And such abilities were direly needed. For the caravans of the Trigal Trade Guild, as was clear from the very outset, traveled the Warrens. Carpola and Demisand gave Duerker and Coltane a beatific, glittering smile as they sat in Coltane's command tent. He said, We knew we had a challenge on our hands. That foul Warren of Hood is wrapped about you tighter than a funeral shroud on a corpse, if you'll forgive the image. The key is to ride fast, to stop for nothing, then get out as soon as humanly possible. In the lead wagon, I maintain the road with every sorceress talent at my command a grueling journey granted but then again we don't come cheap so i took that to mean that they traveled through hood's warren since it's wrapped so tightly around them do you agree i agree and also right before that happened if you'll remember was it lull talking with duiker about the atmosphere in the camp feeling like the warren something was pushing down on them very yes. much like hood's warren so I'm, I'm taking that to be hood's warren for sure but that knowledge with that said before that and then popping out where they are i think that to be the case so given this was hood's warren we both agree mm -hmm. that outrage was from hood himself yes it was i'm assuming that hood would probably be one of the most if not the most powerful ascendant because of the fact that people come to him regardless if, if you want them or not mm. i mean being a god of death i mean it's just like want them or not they're coming <laughs> yeah they, they got to go someplace so is he the most powerful ascendant i don't know if we'll ever have that answered or not i don't think we do no a lot of, i don't think we will have that answered no Duerker said, I still find it hard to fathom that the citizens of Daruzistan, 1,500 leagues distant, should even know of what's happening here, much less care. Carpolan's eyes thinned. He said, ah, well, perhaps I exaggerated somewhat. The heat of the moment, I confess. You must understand, soldiers who not long ago were bent on conquering Daruzistan are now locked in a war with the Panyan Daman, a tyranny that would dearly love to swallow the blue city if it could. Dujek one arm." once fist of the empire and now outlaw to the same, has become an ally. And this, certain personages in Daruzistan know well and appreciate. This is the first hint we've had in this book of what's been taking place on Genabacus during the time period of this book. Yeah. The Panyan Daman was mentioned at the end of Gardens of the Moon as a future threat. Yes. And you know, that's the beauty of the re, 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 read is of mm -hmm. seeing the linkage is becoming clearer. And it takes that many rereads to see the linkages to me. But I love that, seeing this, like, oh, wow. It's so setting it up, wow. <laughs> I do remember my first reread. I was so excited to keep finding things, keep finding things. Because yeah. the first time through, you don't know what anything means. And then you're it. like, oh, wow, he's already talking about this or talking about that. And we're still seeing stuff that we didn't see oh, on yeah. earlier read-throughs. Yeah, it's fantastic. That's the joy of going through with you is taking our time and seeing it. It's like, wow. Agreed. Coltane quietly said, but there is more to it. Carpolan smiled a second time. He said, is this water not sweet? Here, let me pour you another cup. They waited, watching the trader refill the three tin cups arrayed on the small table between them. When he was done, Carpolan sighed and sat back in the plush chair he had had removed from the carriage. He said, Dujik one arm. He sends his greetings, Fisk Coltane. Our office in Daruzistan is small, newly opened, you understand. We do not advertise our services, not openly in any case. Frankly, those services include activities that are, on occasion, clandestine in nature. We trade not only in material goods, but in information, the delivery of gifts, of people themselves, and other creatures. Duerker said, Dujek One-Arm was the force behind this mission. 
Karpola nodded and said, with financial assistance from a certain cabal in Daruzhistan, yes. His words were thus, the Empress cannot lose such leaders as Coltane of the Crow Clan. Extraordinary for an outlaw under a death sentence, wouldn't you say? He leaned forward and held out a hand, palm up. Something shimmered into existence on it, a small oblong bottle of smoky gray glass on a silver chain. He said, and from an alarmingly mysterious mage among the bridge burners, this gift was fashioned. He held it out to Coltane and said, for you, wear it at all times, Fist. An alarmingly mysterious mage. <laughs> nice description for Quick Ben there. Right? But what about Carpola? He must be a pretty bad dude to be leading this bunch and doing what he's doing. Oh, absolutely. He must be one bad son of a gun. Yeah, to protect those carriages going through those warrens. If most other mages don't dare go through the warrens, yes. the warrens he's picking to go through. Yes, yeah. Hood. It's like I, I can understand going through some of these other warrants, but I, if I had access to the realm of death, I think that'd be the last warrant I'd want to go through. <laughs> yeah, it's a shortcut right yeah. to the end. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to travel far if you get messed up in there. <laughs> That's right. That's, you're going to stay. You're just going to stay. Coltane scowled and made no move to accept it. Carpolan's smile was wistful. He said, Dujek is prepared to pull rank on this, friend. Coltane said, an outlaw pulling rank? Carpolan said, ah, well, I admit I voiced the same query. His reply was this, never underestimate the Empress. Mm. Silence descended, the meaning behind that statement slowly taking shape. Duerker thought, locked in a war against an entire continent, stumbling onto a recognition of an even greater threat, the Panyan Daman. Shall the Empire alone fight on behalf of a hostile land? Yet, how to fashion allies among enemies? How to unify against a greater threat with the minimum of fuss and mistrust? Outlaw your occupying army, so they've no choice but to step free of Lacine's shadow. Dujek, ever loyal Dujek, even the ill-conceived plan of killing the last of the old guard, Tayshren's foolishness and misguided idea, insufficient to turn him. So now he has allies, those who were once his enemies, perhaps even Caladan Brood and Andamander Rake themselves. Duerker turned to Coltane and saw the same knowledge there in his drawn, stern visage. Mm. Lacine is using some next-level tactics there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How bad must the Panyan Daman be for Lacine to table taking Daruzhistan for the time being? You know, the crazy thing, it's hinted at in that paragraph you just read about the even greater threat right within this whirlwind the whirlwind is not even seen as a threat apparently not much of one no i didn't take that the same way oh, okay okay so they're in a hostile land on genabacus mm -hmm. when they get there they want to conquer what they're after derujistan right. was the main thing i think right and then when they got there they found out there was an even bigger threat than the forces that were already arrayed against oh, them. Oh, okay. And okay. so they were like, oh, well, we better ally with everybody so that we can take out that bigger threat. Yeah, but you're right. What next level plans within plans there? It would have to be a pretty nasty kingdom, or I don't even know what you'd call it. Yeah, it's a, even knowing what I know, even future for, I haven't, haven't read the book, I don't even know what you call them. They're such a weird, it's such a, it's almost the same thing as this holy war here with the Shaikh. It's just another type of holy war. It's, it's like a next level holy war though, right? Uh, yeah. Is that the best way of describing it? Because it's yeah. so, so wild. I mean, it's so hard to describe that. <laughs> yeah, holy war. The, 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 the good... Panyan Doman, man, that's a, that's a bad bunch right there. <laughs> <laughs> truly horrific. Yeah, truly horrific. Coltane reached out and received the gift. Carpolan said, the Empress must not lose you, Fist. Wear it, sir, always. And when the time comes, break it against your own chest even if it's your last act, though I suggest you do not leave it until then. Such were its creator's frantic instructions. Carpolan grinned again and said, And such a man, that creator. A dozen ascendants would dearly love his head served up on a plate, his <laughs> eyes pickled, his tongue skewered and roasted with peppers, his ears grilled. Duerker cut in, Your point is made. <laughs> Who else besides Shadow Throne has Quick Ben pissed off? I'm assuming whoever he's worked for, if he's worked with anybody, <laughs> he probably is pissing them all off, I guess. Oh. I can't wait till we finally get into that man. <laughs> <laughs> Quick is one of my, all, all the bridge burners, man, all the surviving bridge burners are some of my favorite characters of all time, but Quick holds a special place for me. 
just him and Kalam in particular have that because those yeah. that brotherhood with them too. But Quick is an interesting one. <laughs> He's a cool character. Yes, he's real cool, dude. He's enigmatic. You never know just exactly what's going on with him. Even I know with it. his friends, he's always keeping things oh, he's, close to his he's chest. He's super cagey, but he's but he's always funny, though. Yes. He's not like these other guys that are so wound up tight mages. This guy's got a sense of humor. You know, he's like he's more like a, one of the fellows almost, but he ain't. <laughs> he is, but he isn't, you know? Yeah. He's not arrogant. No. Like a lot of the mages are. He's very humble. I think he thinks highly of himself, but well, yeah. he's not outwardly <laughs> braggadocious. No, no, not at all. He doesn't go around saying, I'm going to go do this, and then does it. He just does it. You know, <laughs> he just goes and does it. Coltane placed the chain around his neck and slipped the bottle beneath his buckskin shirt. After a time, Carpolan said, a dire battle awaits you come dawn. I cannot stay, will not stay. Though mage of the highest order, though merchant of ruthless cunning, I admit to a streak of sentimentality, gentlemen. I will not stand witness to this tragedy. More, we have one more delivery to make before we begin our return journey, and its achievement shall demand all of my skills. Indeed, may exhaust them. Hmm. That's interesting. That's very interesting. I wonder where he's going. Yeah. Duerker said, I had never before heard of your guild, Carpolin, but I would hear more of your adventures someday. Carpolin said, perhaps the opportunity will arise, historian. For now, I hear my shareholders gathering, and I must see to reviving and quelling the horses. Although, it must be said, they seem to have acquired a thirst for wild terror. No different from us, eh? He rose. <laughs> Confirmed. Those horses definitely have PTSD. <laughs> I guess that's the only way you can get a horse to enter strange and unknown realms is have to get, these, get the PTSD ones. So they're like, they want more of this action. So the only time they feel alive is when they're running for their lives. <laughs> Man, I guess. what I type know. of damage? Adrenaline junkie horses always on the edge of death. <laughs> oh my good gracious. I wouldn't have thought about horses being adrenaline junkies, but that's pretty funny. Colting growled, my thanks to you and your shareholders. Carpolin asked, have you a word for Dujek one-arm fist? Coltane's response startled Duerker, slipping a rough blade of suspicion into him that would remain, nagging and fearful. Coltane said, no. Carpolin's eyes widened momentarily. Then he nodded and said, We must be gone, alas. May your enemy pay dearly come the morrow, Fist. Coltane said, They shall. Mm. Why do you think Coltane didn't send a message back to Dujak there? I don't know. Because I, I would think he has a responsibility to give some kind of report to Dujak on what's going on. So that when Dujak, if Dujak comes over here with some putative force, he's got some information from Coltane himself. I mean, isn't that how a military organization works? But then again, Dujek is outlawed, but I would still think he'd know that this, the help came from Dujek. So Dujek's on his side. He knows that. So I would think he'd said something, at least say thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but dude, come yeah. on, Coltane, show a little gratitude. <laughs> I understand Coltane though. I, you know, Coltane, anything is, he's out here by himself at this point. He knows what's what he can read the writing on the wall. So that may be why he doesn't send anything back either. He thinks he's got nothing to say because he knows what's coming tomorrow. I have trouble coming up with a reason. I guess potentially they could have had some past bad blood. Was Dujek the one that subdued Coltane back in the day? I don't know. It, it, it was the, the emperor did, didn't he? Because he said the emperor made fun of him. It wasn't because Bolt said it earlier. He cut Dujak's arm off, didn't he? And then. Oh, yes. Yes. It was Dujak that messed up his face and gave him the scar, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. They, that's how yeah. they. Yes. But so Dujak was just a regular soldier then. He was a soldier then, yes. Yeah. So that would have to have been under old guard, maybe death of old door. <laughs> possible i would have thought they would have brought that up because I, I would think that coltane would have respected dasm and, and there's no mention of that so it, it's not going to be dasm it's going to have to just be directly under kellen bed and that also makes me wonder at coltane's age because i never pictured him as that old but if bolt is old and coltane was leading the wiccans in that original uprising bolt also seems older than coltane he calls yeah. him uncle you know it's weird yes. You know this. You, you can have an uncle that's your same age. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> I've had friends that had nieces and, and uncles the same age as themselves. I it was in elementary school that happened to me. I was like, wait, what, what, what? <laughs> yeah, I had some cousins <laughs> that were about the same age as my mom and her younger brother. 
because she had an older sister that mm. she had kids pretty young. Okay. Sudden bounty could not affect complete rejuvenation, but the army that rose with the dawn revealed a calm readiness that Duerger had not seen since Gellor Ridge. The refugees remained tightly packed in a basin just north of the valley mouth. The weasel and foolish dog clans guarded the position, situating themselves along a rise that faced the assembled forces of Corbolo Dom. More than 30 rebel soldiers stood ready to challenge each and every Wiccan horse warrior, and the inevitable outcome of that clash was so obvious, so brutally clear, that panic ripped through the massed refugees in waves, hopelessly rippling surges this way and that, and wails of despair filled the dust-laden air above them. 30 to 1. What an overwhelming sight. Yes. That would cause despair. <laughs> Absolutely. And those Wiccans, they're standing their ground, not showing any fear. That's crazy. Those guys face those kind of odds all the time, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> They've done it for seven or eight months now on the road at 30 to 1, and they're still here. It still impresses, though. <laughs> oh, it does. Coltane sought to drive through the tribesmen blocking the valley mouth, and do so quickly, and he thus concentrated his Crow clan and most of the seventh at the front. A fast, shattering breakthrough offered the only hope for the rearguard clans, and indeed for the refugees themselves. Durker sat on his emaciated mare, positioned on a low rise slightly to the east of the main track, where he could just make out the two Wiccan clans to the north, Corbolo Dom's army somewhere unseen beyond them. The carriages of the Trigal Trade Guild had departed, vanishing with the last minutes of darkness before the eastern horizon began its pale awakening. Corporal List rode up, reining in beside Duerker. He said, A fine morning, sir. The season is turning. Change rides the air. Can you feel it? Duerker eyed List and said, One as young as you should not be so cheerful this day, Corporal. List said, Nor one as old as you so dour, sir. <laughs> Duerker said, Hood damned upstart. Is that what familiarity breeds? List grinned, which was answer enough. Duerker's eyes narrowed. He asked, and what has your Jagoot ghost whispered to you, List? List said, something he himself never possessed, historian. Hope. Duker said, hope? How? From where? Does Pormqual finally approach? List said, I don't know about that, sir. You think it's possible? Duker said, no, I do not. List voiced his agreement. Nor I, sir. Duker asked, then what in Fainer's hairy balls are you going on about, List? List shrugged and said, not sure, sir. I simply awoke feeling, feeling as if we'd just been blessed, God touched or something. Durker muttered, a fine enough way to meet our last dawn. The Tregan and Billard tribes were readying themselves, but the sudden blaring of horns from the seventh made it clear that Coltane was not interested in the courtesy of awaiting them. The crow lancers and mounted archers surged forward up the gentle slope toward the eastern hill of the Billard. List shouted, historian! Something in List's tone brought Duerker around. List was paying no attention to the crow's advance. He faced the northwest, where another tribe's riders had just appeared, spreading out as they rode closer in numbers of appalling vastness. Duerker said, The Kundril, said to be the most powerful tribe south of Vathar, as we can now acknowledge. Horse hoofs thundered toward the rise, and they turned to see Coltane himself approach. Coltane's expression was impassive, almost calm as he stared northwestward. Clashes had begun at the rearguard position, the day's first drawing of blood, most of it likely to be Wiccan. Already the refugees had begun pushing southward, in the hope that Will alone could see the valley prized open. The Kundril, in the tens of thousands, formed two distinct masses, one directly west of Sanamon's mouth, the other farther to the north, on a flank of Corbolo Dom's army. Between these two was a small knot of war chiefs, who now rode directly toward the rise where sat Durker, List, and Coltane. Durker said, Looks like personal combat is desired, Fist. We'd best ride back. Coltane said, No. Durker's head turned. Coltane had uncouched his lance and was readying his black feathered round shield on his left forearm. Durker said, Damn you, Fist, this is madness. Coltane said, Watch your tongue, historian. Durker's gaze fixed on the short stretch of silver chain visible around the man's neck. He said, whatever that gift is that you're wearing, it'll only work once. What you do now is what a war chief of the Wiccans would, but not a fist of the Empire. Coltane snapped around at that, and Duker found the barbed point of the lance pricking his throat. Coltane rasped, and just when can I choose to die in the manner I desire? 
You think I will use this cursed bauble? Freeing his shield hand, he reached up and tore the chain from his neck. He said, You wear it, historian. All that we have done avails the world not, unless the tale is told. Hood take Dujek one arm. Hood take the empress. He flung the bottle at Duerker, and it struck unerringly the palm of his right hand. Fingers closing around the object, he felt the serpentine slither of chain against calluses. The lance point kissing his neck had not moved. Their eyes locked. There's a lot of tension in that scene. <laughs> mm-hmm. Big time. Yeah. This needs to be on the screen. These are some massively tense and amazing moments in this chapter. It's just been chock full of it. His patience must really be short if he's putting that tip on Duerker's throat, you know? Ooh, yeah. Liz said, excuse me, sirs. It appears that this is not an instance of desired combat, if you would both observe. Coltane pulled the weapon away, swung around. The Kundral war chiefs waited in a row before them, not thirty paces away. They wore, beneath skins and furs and fetishes, a strange grayish armor that looked almost reptilian. Long mustaches, knotted beards, and spiked braids, all black, disguised most of their features, though what remained visible was sun-darkened and angular. Reptilian armor. I wonder what that's made out of. Well, gator or croc or... <laughs> I don't know, because we're on Seven Cities. I don't know how much of a presence they have here. I don't think, yeah, there's not much that I know of. Does that count as a spoiler? <sighs> you might have to. One nudged his pony a step closer and spoke in broken Malazan. Blackwing, how think you the odds this day? Coltane twisted in his saddle, studied the dust clouds now both north and south, then settled back. He said, I would make no wager. The war chief said, we have long awaited this day. He stood in his stirrups and gestured to the south hills, then said, Tregan and Ballard both, this day. He waved northward, then said, And Caneld and Semk, ay, even to Thanzi, what's left, that is, the great tribes of the south, Odons. Yet who among them is all the most powerful? The answer is with this day. Duerker said, You'd better hurry. He thought, We're running out of soldiers for you to show your prowess on, you pompous bastard. Coltane seemed to have similar thoughts, though his temper was cooler. He said, the question belongs to you, nor do I care either way, its answer. The war chief asked, are such concerns beyond the Wiccan clans then? Are you not yourselves a tribe? Coltane slowly settled the lance's butt in its socket. He said, no, we are soldiers of the Malazan Empire. Duerker thought, hood's breath, I got through to him. The war chief nodded, unperturbed by that answer. He said, then be watchful, Fisk Coltane, while you attend to this day. The riders wheeled about, parting to rejoin their clans. Coltane looked around and said, I believe you have selected a good vantage, historian, so here shall I remain. Duerker asked, Fist? A faint smile touched his lean features. He said, For a short time. The Crow clan and the seventh gave it their all, but the forces holding the mouth of the valley from their high ground to either side and farther down the valley's throat did not yield. The chain of dogs contracted between the hammer of Corbolo Dom and the anvil of the Tregan and Billard. It was only a matter of time. The actions of the Kundril clans changed all of that, for they had come not to join in the slaughter of the Malazans, but to give answer to the one question demanded of their pride and honor. The south mass struck the Tregan position like a vengeful god's scythe. The north was a spear thrusting deep into Corbolo Dom's flank. A third hitherto unseen force swept up from the valley itself, behind the Ballard. Within minutes of the perfectly timed contacts, the Malazan forces found themselves unopposed, while the chaos of battle reigned on all sides. Corbolo Dom's army quickly recovered, reforming with as much precision as they could muster, and drove back the Kundril after more than four hours of pitched battle. One aim had been achieved, however, and that was the shattering of the Semk, the Caneld, and whatever was left of the Tithansi. Half an answer, Coltane had muttered at that point, in a tone of utter bewilderment. The southern forces broke the Tregan and Ballard an hour later, and set off in pursuit of the fleeing remnants. With dusk an hour away, a lone Kundral war chief rode up to them at a slow canter, and as he neared they saw that it was the spokesman. He'd been in a scrap and was smeared in blood, at least half of it his own, yet he rode straight in his saddle. He reined in ten paces from Coltane. Coltane spoke. You have your answer, it seems. The war chief said, We have it, Blackwing. Coltane said, The Kundril. Surprise flitted on the warrior's battered face. 
He said, you honor us, but no. We strove to break the one named Corbolo Dom, but failed. The answer is not the Kundral. Coltane asked, then you do honor to Corbolo Dom? The war chief spat at that, growled his disbelief. He said, spirits below, you cannot be such a fool. The answer this day. The war chief yanked free his tulwar from its leather sheath, revealing a blade snapped ten inches above the hilt. He raised it over his head and bellowed, The Wiccans! The Wiccans! The Wiccans! Mm. What a twist that is. <laughs> As I jump to my feet and pump my fist in the air for the second time this chapter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'd be a good end to an episode, too. Oh, yes. Magnificent. And thus the chapter ends. Mm. Goodness gracious. Pretty good stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was. Really good stuff. Wow. Every chapter, like, oh, it's a good chapter, but it's really exhilarating as we get to the end here. Uh, oh yes, yeah, it's getting, it's getting all. I mean, it's been awesome, but it's like as we has approached these moments like this, where it's just this chapter was just awesomeness personified from front to end of just nonstop action for this whole chapter. It took us three weeks to get through it. I mean, that's a lot, that's a lot of action. Yes, definitely. <laughs> awesome. For standout moments. The additional detail regarding the relationship between the Jagut and the Talani Mass was much appreciated. Yeah. Talani Mass still sound like the bad guys to me, though, in this yeah. scenario. They do at this one particular scenario, I agree, with the graves of the, you know, the of this Jagut family that they were tracking and killing here, this ghost that's speaking to List. But I kind of understand, because we did cover this back there, about the fact that, you know, there's no telling how many millions of Talan I'm asked, were killed whenever these Jagut would do things like freeze the continents, freeze their food supplies, freeze their peoples, you know. Mm -hmm. So I understand why they would be miffed, but it's like it's like just kill it, you know. <laughs> just kill the thing. Don't go to such torment, you know, to torture this poor thing and and it could have still been alive for years under there, for all we know. I don't know why they just couldn't, you know, dismember it and kill it <laughs> and be right. done with it, you know. Gotcha. The Wiccan response to the council's proposal to purchase a hundred horses. <laughs> <laughs> epic, epic. Uh oh, I, I, you know, I, I'm always blown away that the, that the that after having gone with these people for so many months and and knowing, like talk, talk about the aristocrats who want these horses, you know, they know how the Wiccans view them. <laughs> Do they know them? I mean, the, the, going not. back to them being out of touch. Yeah, they must not. Maybe know they're just so know. narcissistic that they don't know anything about their surroundings. That must be their entire reality. Is am I going to get my bath today? Are my clothes yeah. going to be clean? Uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I guess. Yeah, not that I'm on the run with you know thousands of other people for my life. No, but the, you're right. They just they've, they've been oblivious. Apparently, Coltane's kept them too uh, at ease <laughs> on this trip. The Trigal Trade Guild's emergence from the Warren. The descriptions of their carriages and the horses pulling them, all of it. Uh, yes. The way they came out of there, ripping out of the horses, looking oh, yeah. crazy, lathered. <laughs> really cool. Oh, yeah. And, and this is one that's a real core memory for this book is those guys showing up. I, I like those guys. And we never get enough of them, but they're always entertaining when they do show up. And I just love these guys. And the first introduction to them, it's a big core memory for me. And a huge fist pumping in the air moment there, too. So. What a bunch of madmen. It's almost like the French Foreign Legion or something, where it's a bunch of desperate people that are trying to get paid as mercenaries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. We just want to get paid, man. We just want to get paid. <laughs> but these guys, I mean, they're just like, but they're. But what drives someone? It's got. I, mean, I understand desperation for money, but this is what happens to guys in this world who you can't retire after going through the crap these guys have gone through. So it's like at least they find a use for their craziness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they got Holtain and our guys. Here's the important thing for me: is the fact that if this or these people's last day on this planet, hey, they brought them some food and water so they could at least go out with not starving and thirsting to death as they fight for their lives. 
Right. At least got, you know, it, you know, it's like that was such a big thing for me because it's like it, it helps even the odds somewhat, at least on the mental on the outset. So they're like, OK, we're not feeling like we're just going to just lay down here and die. At least we got something we can fight with now. Right. It would be kind of like a double whammy in a positive direction. Number one, you're going to feel better because you ate and you, you were hydrated all of a sudden. Yes. Number two, that just feeling better would give you hope that you could yes. do more than just we're later. Gonna do, yeah, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to do this, man. So, and so we've made it this far. We're going to do it. And so <laughs> I think that would make the people feel like that at least. And it was cool to find out that Dujek One Arm was responsible for providing the aid to the yes. Coltane and the Chain of Dogs. Quite touching, I found. You know, that was a very moving thing for me to because I love Dujek. What little bit we get to see that fellow, but he's so cool. He's such a great commander. And to know that he was responsible for that was very touching. Very awesome. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen Coltane have some kind of response for him, but it was very Coltane of him to not yes. have a response. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I very agree. laconic. <laughs> yeah. He got nothing to say. He's just going to do it. He's just yes. going to do it. Yeah. Coltane. Mm. And receiving confirmation that Lacine outlawed Dujek as part of a larger tactic to take on the Panyan Domin and allow them to ally with the forces on Genovacus. Yeah. That was pretty cool. That's a big relief for me, knowing that this is all, quote unquote, part of the plan. Is The plan. The, the plan. Yeah. My plan. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And then finding out that Quick Ben has pissed off a lot more <laughs> ascendance than just Shadow Throne. I'd like to see that list. Oh, I know it, dude. I, I absolutely, because that's just too funny. Knowing that this guy's like, Dad, come. He's got a way with him, but she's just really <laughs> taking all people left and right. It's like, way to go, man. And then the twist of the Kundral turning on the other tribes to support the Wiccans. That was really interesting. You know, and that's the other massive core memory for I have of that is those guys showing up and throwing their hat in the ring with them. Kind of while these guys were kind of because the way that it felt to me is like the Kundra and all those guys were doing the fight in that day while the Wiccans and them were kind of enjoying their having full bellies and full tummies and with water we're ready to go for the next battle and it's such so they did this fighting to impress the Wiccans and join them dude that's such a massive core memory for me a massive feel good right when we need it too <laughs> do you think that if they had defeated Corbolo Dom that they would have thought they were equal to or better than the Wiccans and since they didn't they weren't able to defeat Corbolo Dom that proved to them that the Wiccans were the best yes I think so I think it's the fact that because because the fact that it's known that Coltane has been running for months more than more than half a year if not three quarters of the year, and he's and he's kept all these people alive, and most of it, and so many of his people alive. I mean, that's they have to be. They had to be really worried that they they may they know if it was just them versus Coltane, they couldn't take it. They wanted to prove themselves to Coltane. That's cool. It's like well, he earned their respect all this time, and these guys are like, we can't, we just can't stand by this. This man's honorable. With well, this man's honorable, we can't be part of this. I love how that kind of worked out. It's cool to see that type of behavior. Yeah, yeah, very much so. All right, Billy, good job tonight. Hey, great episode, man. Yeah. You got any final thoughts before you drop off here? Just an amazing chapter, man. Two, count them two stand up and cheer moments. Just <laughs> real, real quick back to back. And you, you get the tire, the tri gal, and the Kundra. Wow. Just such an amazing setup as we're rapidly approaching close to the end. We're, we're, we're so close, and I'm so jacked. <laughs> I get more and more jacked. He's sound like Butters. You know, are you, are you yeah. pumped up, Butters? Yeah, yeah. I'm pumped. It's like, dude, I, 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 that's me. I'm like really pumped right now. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm really pumped. <laughs> it's hard not to be really excited. Whew. Yeah. Great episode, man. Great episode. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. We'll see you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.